Come on, would you help me welcome everybody watching online this morning with us? It is a pleasure to uh, have you connect with us online, whatever platform you may be joining us on. It's uh, the right place for you at the right time. You didn't come here by accident. You didn't click that play button by accident. I believe you're right where you need to be. And if you'll hang with me for a few minutes, I want to give you some things to help you on your journey, on the road of your journey. And uh, I want to start today, though, by acknowledging what has, what has happened in the Middle East. Um, you know, we've, we've got friends who are uh, actually have become uh, part of our church family again, um, and they minister quite a bit to the Jewish uh, people and to Messianic uh, believers, and uh, know that Paul is somewhere in the country right now. He was in South Florida this week. He's going to be somewhere this week, um, because this is the season, this week, actually, of Feast of Tabernacles. Um, uh, Paul's family that is actually here. Some Jewish people actually build kind of a dwelling thing in the back of their homes or at their synagogue or places where they gather together. They have meals. They remember God's provision for them, their families, their history. They celebrate his um, accomplishments, the victory that was, that was won through their wandering through the wilderness, but God was always with them. And that's what's celebrated at this time. And what's even more troubling about the timing of the attacks that happened in Israel, from Gaza into Israel, um, they happened just before this week of celebrating, where they eat and they remember what God has done for their people, for their ancestors, and even for their lives, what he promises to do. It's just, uh, just not good. And right after Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, where they just came through that season and they're heading into this festival. So as troubling as, in, as the images and the stories that we have seen and that we have heard can be, there's also a reminder that on this earth there will never be total peace from strife and conflict. Now Israel was working toward a historic peace agreement with Saudi Arabia. And other countries that start with the letter I don't like that at all. I did that on purpose so this video didn't get flagged for me talking with certain buzzwords because that happens. Actually, when the piano plays at the end or if it's even played at the beginning, we get a notice that we don't own the rights to that music and it's been banned from being listened to in other countries because music was playing. So the technology that is a, an advantage and a tool can also be something that we have to be mindful of as we're, we're going through it. So the countries that don't appreciate that historic peace agreement that was being uh, negotiated um, responded. But what we have as a reminder is that there will never be total peace on this earth, ever. Because we don't put our hope in man's peace, but in the peace that comes directly from knowing Jesus. We'll never see peace fully on this earth. It's only found in Jesus. So while watching the news about this attack that you know, began yesterday morning as I was watching, I was reminded of Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to do like I did last week. I'm going to read you a bunch of verses. Then I've got some thoughts for you that go back to the book of uh, Psalms. So is it all right if I read a bunch of verses to you that um, kind of highlight what I just said there about peace and that we need to be careful that we don't let earthly peace be something that moves us to a place of complacency? Just because everything's going well in your season right now, you should never become lethargic or complacent. You need to always be spiritually aware and on point. But it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonica about a lot of things, and one of them was about the return of Jesus. Now he says this, now concerning how and when all this will happen, this is the New Living Translation, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write to you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, kind of like a thief breaking in your house at night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as, su as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there'll be no escape. What he's saying is, your hope is not in man's peace. Your hope needs to be, to be in the relationship that you come into by faith in Jesus Christ. That's where your peace is found. Don't be caught unaware. Think that everything's cool, everything's great, because everything looks fine. It's like when I was in middle school, that movie, A Thief in the Night, came out, and they terrorized our youth group with that movie. I mean, terrorized us. There should have been a permission slip for that movie. I went home that night thinking, any wrong thought, and I was a teenager. You can imagine how many wrong thoughts a male teenager has. 
I mean, any wrong thought, if he comes back, I'm left behind. I saw what happened to the people that got left behind. Then a Left Behind series comes out, terrorizes people even more. But see, we're not moved by those things. As he said to them, hey, listen, you guys know all about that, that Jesus is going to return. The previous chapter even said, listen, be encouraged by that. In spite of the persecution and what you may be going through in life, be encouraged. Because you don't have to be concerned about his, the timing of his return. You live with the hope and the confidence of knowing that he is going to return. And it doesn't scare you. It doesn't frighten you whenever it's going to happen. Verse 4 says, but you aren't in the dark about these things. Dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. That's a word for you, everybody. Be clear-headed. Stay alert spiritually. And I'm not talking about hoarding up a bunch of stuff in a bunker somewhere for the end times. That's not what he's talking about there. He's saying, be clear-minded. There is going to be trouble on this earth. The Bible says it will literally be like it was in the days of Noah. It's not going to get better, everybody. There are going to be plenty of negotiations and talks about peace. And as you know, most negotiated treaties and things, they've all been broken, or at least not fully enforced. So your hope in those things is not where your peace should reside. Now, we pray that those things happen. For the people who live in those areas and those regions, we want to see their well-being. But we also want to see the return of the Lord says, so be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert, be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. There's a whole great teaching in that right there, everybody, but I ain't going through the tribulation. I'll say that again. I'm going in the first load. I've got a first class ticket. But like one of our previous children's pastors used to say, it's going to happen when it's going to happen. I'm ready and I'm going. But I like this verse. He's not going to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other. Build each other up just as you're already doing. Again, these verses remind us that our hope is in Jesus and that we've got to remain spiritually alert at all times. Now, some of us really love the conspiracy aspect of it. We love the, the, you know, the, the, the setup aspect of everything. Hey, these people are talking to these people. And, and I've got friends. I've got Joe Morris, a guy who speaks at our church. He has an end of, what's it, e, EDU on YouTube. If you want to see like current stuff, go to YouTube. Look up Joe Morris in EDU. I think he was putting up one either yesterday or today about some of the events because he stays really attuned to this. In fact, he had a trip planned to Israel at the beginning of November and all that's kind of on hold. My brother-in-law was going with somebody else the end of this month. That's kind of on hold. I don't think it's a good idea to fly an airplane into Israel when rockets can be going through the air. Do you? Yeah, I don't either. But these verses again remind us just how important it is to be spiritually alert, that we don't get lulled into sleep by culture and moved away, swept away by emotions and feelings and things that just aren't as important as being more alert and in tune on the inside. Jesus said in John 10, 10, very clearly, we've got an adversary who who seeks to steal, kill, and to destroy. I don't fear him, even a little bit. I don't fear him. For my family, even a little bit, because perfect love casts out fear. And I believe that those who are led by the Spirit of God, which we've been promised as children of God, He would do, He would lead us. Hey, I'll be in the right place at the right time. I'll go right when I need to go right, left when I need to go left. I'll stop when I need to, I'll sit still when I need to sit still. I'm not in fear, and neither should we be in fear. Because His love that is that shield for us that we just read about Paul talking about, that is what keeps us in perfect peace in here. There may not be peace out here, but there is perfect peace in here. Now, all of these events, again, are happening just before what they call Sukkot, the annual festival, which commemorates the time 
of the Jews, the Israelites, leaving Egypt, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years before entering the promised land. During this period, they lived in what was called temporary shelters, Sukkot, as they journeyed through the desert. And this festival serves as a reminder of their dependence on God for everything. I mean, can you imagine loading up your car with as much food as you could load into it? If you change the clothes, say, hey, kids, we're going. Going where? Somewhere. Anywhere. When will we get there? Not quite sure. How many of you would say, um, mom and dad need prayer, and we need to call the grandparents? Something's not right. I'm not getting in that car with no direction, right? Well, the Israelites knew they were headed toward a promise from God, but they also needed the protection of God in that journey. And there's a series of Psalms that I was originally looking at, and then after these events happened, it really drove it even deeper into my heart to share these with you. These Psalms are what they call Psalms of Ascent. They were Psalms that the Jewish people would literally sing on their way to these three festivals in Jerusalem that they celebrated every year. And the purpose of the Psalms, as they sung them, to remind them of God's protection. Because as they traveled, there were robbers, there were burglars, there were terrorists, there were enemies, there were people who were not friendly to Israel. And they needed the protection of God, the provision of God, the hand of God with them. So they sang these songs about who God was on these journeys to Jerusalem so as to remind them to build their faith and their confidence in the God who had called them and directed them in the past and like he was doing in current day. And so what I want to do is take one thought from each of these Psalms and give it to you because you might be on a journey and on a road yourself where you need to, by faith, Declare some of these things and then understand with the last four what the promise after the declaration of who God is in those first four, who he is and what that would elicit on the inside of you to be for your life. Are you with me? I just simply called the message a promise for the road. So whatever road you're on, you need a promise. Nobody gets in the car and just says, I'm a wander. No, your gas tank will eventually stop the wandering. Most of us head out to do anything with an objective in mind. God has an objective for your life. He's called you to an eternal purpose, to make a difference in somebody else's life. And as soon as you get on board with that, along with everything else you're doing, I promise you, the road that you're on will be less miserable when you realize, I can make a difference every single day in the life of somebody else for eternity. That's a word for somebody this morning. If, you're, if you've been mired down in the myopic little, you know, small-minded approach to your life and what's going on, I would encourage you, get connected here. Become a greeter at the front door. Volunteer maybe for setup or teardown. Let us know you're interested in doing something with an eternal value, putting your hand to it. And then even do that out in your world. Ask God every day to put somebody in front of you. Help you to see somebody who needs your encouragement who needs your affirmation, who just needs a lift. Because I can promise you, most of the people that are annoying you have got something going on in life, and they've not shared it with you. And if you only heard about it, it might reorient your heart towards them. Now, some people are just total jerks. I get it. But even for them, Jesus died. And he doesn't want them dark in the darkness and asleep at his return. God wants to use you. So these Psalms, I want us to look at them. And the first one, and the first thought is this, the Lord is my keeper. The Lord is my keeper. Psalm 121 verse 5 says, the Lord is my keeper. Verse 7 says, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. That word keeper there literally means to watch over, to guard, or to secure. How many of you do that for your kids? Come on, let me see your hands. Don't be, you know, absent-minded. Be participators. How many of you have done that for your kids? How many of you have ever showed up somewhere and they didn't know you were going to show up there so you could be their keeper? And my dad did that at a party once in middle school. Shocked me. We were just holding hands at that point, me and the other girl, when he showed up like, hey, dad. There's a moment forever etched in my mind and, and caused me to forever live like this. Anybody else live like that? Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, I know young people, students, you don't like that. You're going to do it to yours one day, I promise. If Jesus tarries, you're going to be worse than your parents. You will. 
We've been, every generation has been worse than the one before, which is why the kids complain even more than, than we did. Like, you don't know. You didn't raise for your grandparents. <laughs> the Lord is your keeper, and not from a negative perspective, but as one who watches over to bring safety and protection. The Lord is your keeper. Because when something's important to you, you guard it and you secure it. Anybody got some stuff in your house that's a look, don't touch? And it's put somewhere and nobody messes with it. And if someone brings their children over and they go to touch you, like, ah, 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 we don't mess with that. You're willing to risk a friendship over what's important to you. Am I right? They bring their animal over and their animal steps up on you. You're like, oh no, not today. What's important, we guard. You are so highly important to your Father in heaven. He wants to guard you and keep you safe and protect you. What about what's going on in the Middle East? It's tragic. But I do believe that God is hovering over those cities and those areas that have been the targets of terrorists. I believe he's there and doing all that he can to protect and to watch over his people. Psalm 91 gives us great promises. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High, not some physical structure, but a place of intentional abiding by you and me. Every single day you wake up, God, I thank you that your protection is over me in my life. That's what it's talking about. It says we'll find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. How many of you could use some rest? You'll find rest. Verse 2 says, this I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. Why? Because I know he guards over me. He watches over me. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. Verse 4 says, he'll cover you with his feathers. He'll shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. I have been accused of being nothing but a promise preacher. I am as guilty as they come. Hang me and execute me. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. So shoot the first dart, everybody. You're right, I'm a promise preacher. In Hebrews it says, He is our exceedingly great reward. It's by His exceedingly great and precious promises. I mean, the words all throughout Scripture. Yes, I'm a promise preacher. Because they are our armor and our protection. They communicate to us what He will do for us. What he's promised us is his actual word, and he watches over it to perform it. Verse 5 says, don't be afraid of the terrors of the night. Why? Because you can have a promise that says you don't need to be. Or nor the arrow that flies in the day. Don't dread the disease that stalks in darkness. I mean, we protect ourselves. We do all we need to do, but we're never shutting church down because we got a promise. Nor the disaster that strikes at midnight. Listen, all that to say this, God will keep you and watch over you. He's promised. That's what they sang about on the way to Jerusalem. Here's the second one. The Lord is my peace. And we're going to do this here. Psalm 122, verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This is not a prayer necessarily that there would ever be the absence of strife because you'll always have strife between people. Always. But it is about this word peace that pertains to the livelihood, to the safety, to the culture, to the people, that they would be stable all of those things, that they'd be able to put their head down at night. It is a prayer for that. So can we do that this morning? Because there's a promise associated with this. One version says that the people who do this will prosper, but I love how it says this. May they be secure who love you, who love Jerusalem. I want security. So I'm going to pray that they're secure over there because that is the epicenter of all biblical activity. Before us and after us, Jerusalem. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we pray your word. We return it to you so that it does not go without the power to be executed and come to pass. Father, we pray for the safety, for the protection, for the well-being, for the livelihoods of those in Jerusalem. Father, we thank you for the Jewish people, that you would watch over them and their families. Be with those and comfort those, Father, who have lost loved ones, who've lost livelihoods. Father, may the young people, the children who may have been emotionally traumatized through this, may they recover quickly by the wholeness of the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem so that it might be also secure and well with us. In Jesus' name.
It says, peace be within your walls and security within your towers. Now, just as we're told to pray for the peace for Jerusalem, I believe peace is also a gift for us. If you don't believe me, let me show you. Philippians 4, verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Anybody worried about anxious about anything right now? Be honest. Go ahead, raise your hand. First step to recovery is admit you got an issue. Anybody anxious about anything? Sure. He didn't tell us that you're in sin by being anxious. He's just giving you a directive that you don't necessarily have to be anxious. But instead, you can pray about everything, talk to God about everything. God, I'm anxious. I'm unsettled by this. This person has annoyed me. My business is making me a little nervous. My family is just a little shaky right now. God, these things are troubling me. But I know this. Listen to the rest of the verse. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace. Now, God, in light of all that, I know this, that you're the God of peace. And that what I commit to you, you're faithful to keep. If you prayed over your kids, you remind, when they were small, you dedicated them back to the Lord, you remind God of that. God, way back then, we put a flag in the dirt, said on this day, we committed them to you. God, I'm reminding you of that promise and that commitment to watch over my children. God, when we stood before our friends and our family and a minister, when we got married, we said this was forever. Now, some things have happened, but God, we're putting our trust in you. I need you to work in me. Isn't that bozo? That, um, it's hard to get along with. God, do a work on the inside of us. Are, are you with me? Pray about it. Talk to God about everything because that's when the promise of peace comes. Then you'll experience God's peace. Or you can sit around, just complain, ugh, 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 do a lot of that. Ugh. How many of you like, can't stand it when your kid does that? Typically, you got to go to the bathroom, but you're like, what's the problem? Ugh, ugh, ugh. Our son used to do that. You know what we figured out it was? His socks. You know that thing, that little that strip in the sock? Oh, my. If that was off, no one was happy. You, you remember that? It'd be like, someone check his socks. Gosh, he's making everybody miserable. You can sit around and make noise and complain and grunt and move about and everything, or you can get spiritual, get scriptural. Talk to God about it. Say, God, this is making me mad. I'm angry about this. I'm upset about this. I'm troubled by this. But let it turn into, like the children of Israel did, a psalm of ascent. And you say, but God, we know this, you've been faithful. What we've committed to you, you've been faithful to keep. And you've also given us peace for the journey, for the road. And then it says, this peace which exceeds anything we can understand, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So listen, if you're tempted to fear or get upset about anything, stop. Stop. Just stop. Talk to God. For some of you, that might mean you have to be quiet. It's just going to be a challenge in and of itself. And thank God for all you do know and all He has done in your life. Sometimes the rehearsal of His faithfulness will bring you to a place of confidence and faith and peace like you have never known before. God, when I thought it was over then, something's wrong here because I'm still here now. Even though the last time I thought it was going to be too much or over, yet you brought us through, you brought me through, you've positioned me here. Then the peace of God will be like an army that sets up base camp around your heart and your mind. So talk to God, the Lord of your peace. Here's the third thing. Psalm 123, the, my eyes are on the Lord. My eyes are on the Lord. Psalm 123, verse 1, to you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Now this one's a challenge because you can't see God. I got images of what I think it might be like. I mean, that's partly due to Thor and some other Marvel movies. You know, you've got some images maybe in your head of what Man, what it must be like in the throne room. You know, I've got some other ones based on Braveheart and Gladiator, stuff like that, but 
I am certain that none of them compare to the heavenly Jerusalem, the true presence of God where angels are just circumnavigating the throne that is in heaven and singing praise and holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord Almighty. Great is our God. Holy is the Lord. I can't imagine what that looks like, but I know that's happening while I'm anxious. That's happening when I have questions. That's happening when my heart is unsettled. That's happening. So what we're reminded by the psalmist to do is to lift up our eyes, not just physically, but literally the perspective in the attention of your heart above temporal things, earthly things. Be reminded that your God is on a throne in heaven with his son at his right hand as your advocate. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. I know this, that there is no lack of information on any subject in our world today. I've been tinkering around on the, you know, the AI app, you know, kind of for research type things. Hey, what do all theologians say about peace? Lord, I hit that one. I mean, just went like crazy. And I'm not advocating artificial intelligence, anything like that, or cheating. But we don't lack for information. But you know what studies have proven in our quest and thirst for information and the vast amounts that we have at our disposal? We've never been more hopeless and helpless and anxious ever than we are now. So I don't know if having access to anything we would have a question about is necessarily making us more peaceful or making us better. But what I do know is this, that regardless of what answer I need on any subject naturally, I am never to forget that I have a Father in heaven who has promised that when I need wisdom, and James says, just ask him for it. Just ask him for it. Now, I might not find it on an iPad or on my phone, but I'm going to have something happen in here that's going to let me know I'm headed in the right direction or I need to change course or I, need, or I can be settled when everything around me is unsettled. God, I need your wisdom. I need something to help me find the direction that I need in this area in life. I need your yes or your no. Verse 2 goes on to say this, so our eyes look to the Lord. What does that mean? That means in all you're looking, don't forget to look up. Can you just remember that? And in all you're searching, don't forget to look up. Because I think to be forgetful about where your God is and who your God is, is to lose a grasp on everything that you actually need for life. It'd be like a parent who gave every right and every privilege to your children, but you failed to point them towards Jesus, then you have failed as a parent. The best school, the best house, the best car, the best job, the best neighborhood, all of those things are wonderful and they are great. But when a problem occurs in any of those areas, if they don't have Jesus to hold them up, have we given them everything they need? Do we have everything we need for our marriage if the only pursuit has been money? And there's nothing wrong with that. We need stability. If God's gifted you for it, go for it with gusto and don't forget to honor God with the tithe. Go for it. I'll just be honest with you, brother. How do you think it all gets done? Wishes and good thoughts. Can't stand it when people do that. I'm not feeling real well. Send your good thoughts and good vibes. Good thoughts and good vibes. How about coming and cutting my grass? Show up and take me to the doctor, right? I mean... <laughs> Good thoughts and good vibes don't fix that. But knowing what the promises of God are, oh yeah, that's a whole different thing. Send them a scripture. You know, I remember I told y'all when my brother-in-law had his massive heart attack and really died, thankful to me, he's not. It's a true story. You have to go back a few weeks and watch the message. There is a minister, I'll just say who he is. He, he travels with Kenneth Copeland, has for how many years? 30 years he's traveled with him, does his music. One of the calls, first Thing that morning I had to make was to him because my brother-in-law's schedule is intimately tied to his schedule. And so I called the person who you called to talk to him and I told him, and next thing you know, 
a text from Kenneth Coach and my brother-in-law, scripture verse. And I'm like, oh, that's sweet. There's another one. There's another one. It's like, I can't even respond. Stop with the verses. Just one right after another. And then when he called the phone, he said this, there's a healer in the house. Every time he called, he just started the conversation. There's still a healer in the house. I mean, I'll take that over good thoughts and good vibes any day. Somebody who knows what God has promised well enough that they are ready, they are armed to the teeth to tell you what he's promised for you. I'll take that. That's who we need to be for others. That's what you need to be for that single mom that you know. For that family in your neighborhood that's going through a difficult season. That's what you need to know for the families that call themselves a part of this body. I'm, I'm reminded all the time how difficult it is with kids to get anywhere. I watch my daughter with my granddaughter, who is perfect, by the way. Her mother just needs to adjust her schedule and be more on point. But it's tough. It's tough to get a whole family anywhere, much less to church. That's why I'm like, when I see the families that two, three, and four kids, and they're coming to church, I'm like, and his strength is yours, man. That's why we have worship, to give you just some moments to separate from the chaos. But if God ever puts something on your heart for those folks, man, go to them. Man, God put this on my heart. Give you a night out. Here's 50 bucks. Go somewhere. You need a babysitter. Call me. I mean, whatever it is, that's better than a vibe and a thought. But our eyes need to be on the Lord. Here's the, the, the last one before we get to the benefits. The Lord is on my side. Psalm 124, verse 1. If the Lord had not been on our side. Man, how many of you could say that? If the Lord had not been on our side. Scripture goes on to describe what would have happened to Israel had God not been on their side. If you look at Psalm 124, we're not going to read it. But the same is true for us. If the Lord had not been on your side, can you imagine where you'd be sitting today? Some of you might be in prison. <laughs> well, God is on your side, even if you're in prison. I know a church in Alabama that's in almost every single male prison in the state, every single Sunday, and not just with a video. They literally have a dream team doing an actual service in almost every male prison and a good number of the female prisons. And they are literally doing what you and I are doing right now in every one of those facilities every weekend. People who have volunteered, who are part of a team that bring a service into those places. So even if you're there, God's on your side. Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? You need to make that a, a declaration of your life. If God is for me, what can be against me? Psalm 118, verse 6, the Lord is on my side as my helper, I will not fear. The Lord is on my side as my helper, I will not fear. Now listen, if you can say those four things, if you can make them a declaration. The Lord is my keeper. He's my peace. And my eyes are always toward Him. The Lord is on my side. Then can I show you real quickly how that will impact your life? As the Jewish people would say these things, these psalms of ascent on the way to Jerusalem to keep them feeling safe and protected, to remind them of God's hand in their lives, this is what it would promise. That they could not be moved. They could not be moved. Psalm 125, verse 1, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. If you'll make those four declarations your declaration, you'll begin to feel a security and a stability in your life. Just like a mountain can't be moved, neither will you. Neither will you. I'm only about 100 and I think 78, 79 pounds. Keith, how much do you weigh? How much? 300 pounds. How many of y'all think I can move Keith easily? Not even close. Can you imagine if you had force coming at me? Just like my scrawny 178 could not move Keith. We've been promised as those who put their trust in God, you can't be moved either. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. In here, you can't be moved. If your kids are crazy, don't get moved. If the world has lost its ever-loving mind, don't be moved. Because you're like a mountain. Don't be moved. That doesn't mean you're not going to have challenges. It does not mean that difficulties, you won't experience difficulties, because you will. But you won't be moved. 
That's the goal, everybody, to be so confident in those four declarations that regardless of what happens, you're not moved. People look at you and go, why aren't you getting upset? Well, I mean, I got some feelings about this, but it's not moving me. I used to think that was hyper-religion. People who just were so strong in their, 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 con their confession, their confidence in who God was, that they were just unrealistic. Well, maybe some of them were. Maybe they just denied what was really going on around them. But you're not denying what's going on around you by being immovable in faith. No, that's why we are immovable, because there's stuff going on around us. You following me? I just don't need to acknowledge to the point of anxious anxiety and the craziness that everybody else might be going through, because I'm going to be immovable in here. So keep your eyes on your peace, the one who keeps you, the one who's promised to be by your side, and you won't be moved. Here's the next one. Your mouth is filled with laughter. Children of Israel sang about the laughter that came from their confidence in God. Psalm 126, verse 1. All of these out of their English Standard Version. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, this is what they would say. We were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. They were a people who had stepped into the land that God had promised their ancestors. And now they're going to Jerusalem was a celebration and a reminder of God's provision, His faithfulness. It was a reminder of all of those things. And whenever you remember who your God is and what He's done for you, your mouth's going to be filled with laughter. It's all right, man. We've been through other stuff before. But my God is faithful. We've been talking about joy for the past few weeks. Joy is not an emotion. It's a state of the heart, if you ask me, connected to the person of the Holy Spirit in your life. So their mouth was filled with laughter and their tongue with shouts of joy. That's why y'all y'all can't be as quiet as y'all are during praise and worship. You know, I just wish they'd get to the worship part. I like the worship part. Well, what are you going to do about this part here? Their mouth was filled with laughter. Their tongue was shouts of joy. Come on, somebody. I mean, I think there are certain churches with some soul in them that have tapped into the right perspective of where we all ought to be with less pigmentation. Some of y'all following me? What I'm trying to say there? Some of y'all need to just tap into the inner soul and just remember what God's done for you. I'm going to remind you next week when the first song is a song, it's, it's called Again and Again. It's talking about the joy of the Lord. I want some of y'all to hoop a little bit. Just hoop a little bit. Woo! You know, just praise the Lord. I know y'all get loud and you, you hoop a little bit at sporting events. Don't be dead in church. This is where your mouth is to be filled with laughter and your tongue with shouts of joy because he's been good and faithful. He keeps you. He watches over you, protects you. Now, that's not to make light of what you might be going through. I just don't know if I can laugh right now. Well, maybe not now, but you keep declaring who he is and who he's promised to be. Your mouth will be filled with some laughter. It will, because you'll be able to look at your situation from a different perspective. <laughs> what Scripture is saying here is this. Don't panic. Don't let whatever you may be experiencing right now rob you of your joy. Keep living. Show up in your life with the joy of the Lord. Keep living. Show up, because God has given you the greatest gift and joy. Nehemiah 8.10 Nehemiah said, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So it needs to be in your mouth and on your tongue with shouts of joy, somebody. Now, that's not my natural personality. I know I can do it okay up here. Ask my wife. We were just not too long ago in the most charismatic and Pentecostal of environments ever, ever that you could be in. And I'm just not going, yeah, woo, yeah. I'm not naturally that way either. But this is done by faith. Thank you, God. Amen. You, you know what I'm saying? Nothing wrong with that. If you want a dead church, there's a lot of them in the city. I can point you to them. But this one's got life in it. Amen. Our hearts and our mouths are filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. Man, I've been giving y'all so many opportunities. It's like open book quiz, like layups. The, the ball is at the rim and some of y'all are going...
Our mouths are filled with laughter. Amen, somebody? Amen. There you go. Oh, y'all have no idea what that does for me. There you go. Here's the next thing that God will do if you declare all those things. He will give you sleep. Anybody needs some sleep? Yeah. Almost done. Almost done. Y'all don't go anywhere. Psalm 127, verse 2. It is in vain that you rise up early and go, to late, go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. Anybody do that? You get up because you can't sleep. You stay up because you can't sleep. You go to bed late worried. You, 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 you worry in your sleep. It is in vain that you exist like that. Which of those four things at the beginning there do you need to start declaring so that you don't exist like this? Now, it's one thing if you're raising children and you're, you're going to look a certain way. <laughs> Some days it's, they got clothes, all right, socks, good enough, shoes, they might be different, but you know, they're protected from the concrete. Have they got food? Yep. We had, in the beginning of our church one time, we had a family show up literally with a gallon milk jug. And the thing that screws on the top of a bottle and said, just get it in them. I, I kid you not, a gallon milk jug said, just, we're good to get here. Now, that family had a lot of other issues, but that one just, that one took the cake from him. Am I lying, Tammy? That literally happened. Because who knew that a baby's bottle top would screw onto a gallon milk jug? Try it. I mean, last thing we were going to do was unleash a gallon into the baby, but they were just so desperate. They said, just whatever you can do. I mean, I get it. There are seasons in life where you're more anxious than others, where there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on. And if you're not in one of those, praise God for you. But you do need sleep. And this verse says, for he gives his beloved sleep. If you're letting anxiety and frustration keep you awake, you need to speak to your heart and remind yourself. You need to speak to your heart and remind yourself that the Lord is my keeper. The Lord is my peace. And my eyes are on him. The Lord is on my side. And he gives me sleep. Say that along with your melatonin and your CBD or whatever else you might be doing. Say that. Are y'all, are y'all following me? Yeah. M- remember we started all of this by what he said there in 1 Thessalonians. Don't, get, don't be in the dark. You are a spiritual person who's been bought by the blood of Jesus. You belong to God. Don't be in the dark about what belongs to you and who you are and what's been promised. Don't live life kind of half-heartedly when you feel like it, acknowledging God's promises. They are your shield. They're your protection. And they will be the pathway to your sleep. God, my eyes are on you. And if you need to talk to yourself so you stop thinking about something, keep talking. Keep talking. God is my keeper. God is my peace. God gives me sleep. My heart is at rest because of God. Here's the last one. If you've made those first four declarations and you realize that you can't be moved, that your mouth can be filled with laughter and that he'll give you sleep, here's the last one. Your family is blessed. Your family is blessed. See, there's a blessing to those who put God first and for those who live their lives according to the pattern of Scripture. Psalm 128, verse 1 says, How joyful, there it is again. We just keep hitting joy, everybody, don't we? How joyful are those who fear the Lord, all who follow His ways. You will enjoy the fruit of your labor. So it's supposed to work. How joyful, there it is again, and prosperous you will be. It's all right to go after that as long as... God is above the pursuit of those things. Your wife will be like a fruitful grapevine flourishing within your home. This language is weird for us. I get it. (laughs) But you got to remember who this was written to and who wrote it. Within your home, this will be true. Your children will be like vigorous young olive trees as they sit around your table. They'll be filled with life productive for the kingdom of God, fulfilling what God has called them to. That is the Lord's blessing for those who fear him. 
Now, how many of you want your, your family to be blessed? Your marriage to be blessed? Your husband, your wife to be blessed? Your children to be blessed? Walking in all that God has called them to do? Then don't forget who He is. Make those declarations and watch those things become a reality in your life. Remember, the Lord is your keeper. He's your peace. So keep your eyes on Him because He's on your side. If you'll do that, you won't be moved. Your mouth will be filled with laughter. God will give you sleep and your family will be blessed. Let me pray for you real quick and everybody watching online. I pray right now that as you make those declarations and you remember who your God is, that He is faithful and He will keep His word. I pray that you will also walk in the fullness of every promise from Scripture. I bless you now. I place his name on you. May his safety and his protection be yours. May his presence be with you everywhere you go. May you experience the goodness of God, the joy of God, the strength of God in your life. And may everything you put your hand to prosper for your family and for the kingdom of God. If you receive that, would you say amen? Amen. Listen, if you're watching with us online, thanks for being with us. Until we're together again next time, you be blessed. 